It's a modestly budgeted film that had a reasonable impact at the box office, but it's a film that's more influential than people realise. At the time, its writer was one of the most popular authors of his time, often writing about the dangers of new technology. So here's a movie where people bang robots. It's an amusement park. It's the best amusement park in the world. All you have to do is have fun. 1973's Westworld is the brainchild of author Michael Crichton, who, through a long career as a writer and sometimes director, was responsible for The Andromeda Strain, Coma, Congo, ER, Jurassic Park, and of course, Westworld. Westworld was Crichton's first feature film as a director and was conceived of by Crichton as a movie project from day one. Modestly budgeted as most pre-Star Wars science fiction films tended to be, Westworld feels only slightly larger in scope than a television movie of the time. Boy, have we got a vacation for you. The premise is simple enough. For $1,000 a day, you can go to a resort run by Delos where you can go and pretend you're living in one of three time periods aided by ultra-realistic robots programmed to allow your fantasies to come true. Which means sex. There's Roman world where you can bang robots in togas. Here the traveller experiences the sensual, relaxed morality that existed at the peak of the Imperial Roman Empire. Medieval world where you can bang robots in castles and Westworld, where you can bang anatomically correct robots in the Wild West, which I'm told is a location rather than a specific act. The film starts with Richard Benjamin as a recently divorced guy, Peter, going to Westworld for the first time with his buddy, Thanos' dad, aka James Brolin, as John. John's been to Westworld before and conveniently explains the premise to Peter. What about the thing where you go like this over the gun? Fanny. Yeah. What about it? Is that hard to do? The only way to tell the robots apart from the human guests, apart from them trying to murder you later on, is that the robots have ribbed hands. They also have difficulty using mobile phones. Siri, call Barbara. Call Barbara. Barbara. Unlock, unlock, lousy face ID. Peter gets to live out his fantasies as a desperado in the Wild West, betting a robot hooker, breaking out of jail, and taking on the robot gunman played by Yul Brenner, looking like he's just come off the set of his 1960 film The Magnificent Seven. I'm paying a thousand dollars a day for this? And robot whoring, a whole lot of robot whoring. The madam in charge of the robot working girls, depending on your kink, is either Luaxana Troy or the Starfleet computer voice Majel Barrett. It's not a gritty version of the Old West. It's Wild West, remember, a place, not a specific act. So it's not a dirty Wild West. Again, you get the point. This place is really fun. Behind the scenes, things are starting to go a bit wrong. Another one? Alan Oppenheimer, often typecast as a man in a white coat looking serious, is looking serious because it looks like serious things are going wrong in the resort. Small things at first that gradually get more serious. While management acknowledges the seriousness of the problem, the determination is to try and fix things quietly, despite... We don't know exactly how they work. Which is probably why the robots each have six butts. <laughs> oh! That's not supposed to happen. Then, for whatever reason, the robots just snap and kill everyone. The last half hour of the movie is the Yul Brenner bot chasing Peter across Westworld, Medieval World and Roman World. It's not the most exciting chase and perhaps might have been a bit more dynamic with a more experienced director or a slightly bigger budget. Michael Crichton had only directed one TV movie before tackling Westworld, and it kinda shows. The early 70s love affair with slow motion action scenes is on display here as one of the few visual touches that enlivens up the proceedings. Unlike Crichton's other properties, the sense of impending doom once things go wrong is fairly muted. Everything's fine. We don't see all that much of the robot's revenge or revolution, or even if that's what it was. I'm shot. The gunman kills John, and then suddenly that's it. We see some technicians have died, the implication that they probably suffocated behind locked doors, and guests slumped over, but with only a few actually killed on screen. And then there's a short chase where Peter manages to beat the unstoppable robot without too much difficulty. The end, like a PG-rated version of Predator. It's about as tense as an episode of Sesame Street with all the scenes of Oscar the Grouch edited out. 
The hell goddamn machines anyway! That's not supposed to happen! If you're coming to this after watching the HBO Westworld, you might be scratching your head as to how one thing became the other. How a fairly simplistic tale became something with a lot more ambition. Well, the idea of Westworld is just really, really cool. And indeed, Crichton reused the basic premise for his later work, Jurassic Park, just swapping out robots for dinosaurs and Jeff Goldblum. Also for Jurassic Park, swapping an inexperienced noob for a master filmmaker didn't hurt either. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. I'll be right there, I'm just putting on my face. It's a 90 minute film that does good and bad with the core ideas. Westworld's first hour is really good, setting up the theme park idea with Vox Populi. What is the one thing that stands out in your mind about Roman world? The man! <laughs> and the sex with robot idea and the killing robots idea. Peter's new to the concept and full of beans. While park returnee John is just aching for the gunning and whoring, and then Alan Oppenheimer is just getting more and more concerned about things going wrong at an increasing rate. He needs his mama. The acting is generally of a solid standard, but it's not a character study in any way. Half the characters are robots whose backstories involve trying to find somewhere to recharge before their batteries run down and all of the fast charging stations are taken. We are talking about a film that by the time of its release cost around $1.2 million, which was more than a TV pilot or movie of the week usually cost but half the budget of another genre blending western, Blazing Saddles. MGM was the only studio that would take on the picture, and then only if it was cheap. Their reputation as a studio was not the greatest at the time, perhaps because they didn't even have to worry about glass door reviews at the time. The original version of the film was longer and had a little more action, but was missing something. It was originally shot in 30 days to keep the costs down. Reshoots were authorised to help make the film flow a little better, which apparently meant having Richard Benjamin and Yul Brenner walk up and down the same set half a dozen times. The zing of the first hour turns into a short chase devoid of all that much tension. We think the gunfighter has been defeated, but he hasn't. Then he has, and then he hasn't. The ending as originally filmed had more action, a gunfight between the two. But what was filmed did not work all that well. John? Richard Benjamin would go on to work as an actor and director for many years, starring in things like the short-lived sci-fi parody Quark and directing many feature films. James Brolin starred in many series and films. Yul Brenner was already an icon by the time of Westworld. His turn as the gunfighter traded heavily on his image as Chris, leader of the Magnificent Seven, from a film I can't quite recall the name of. Was it MASH? Alan Oppenheimer, perhaps because he already had the coat, was also A, Dr. Rudy Wells and Six Million Dollar Man, and later the voice of Skeletor. Give me this. Put hair on your chest. The 1970s had a lot of science fiction about people turning out to be, not people, but robots after all. What's his problem? Dude, are you serious? Look at my face. Westworld was probably a trendsetter, influencing similar stories like the Fembots in The Bionic Woman or the Android Invasion in Doctor Who, as well as the much more successful film, the Stepford Wives, which, like Westworld, was also a film about having sex with robots. The 70s was a more innocent time, where thoughts of guilt-free sex with wash and wear robots never led to any consideration by audiences of the poor schlub who has to design working genitalia for robots. On the other hand, Delos needed a lottery system to deal with the huge numbers of applications for quality assurance personnel. No matter what you did, he'll always be one jump ahead of you. You haven't got a chance! Yes, I do. I generally enjoy Westworld as a film, at least for the first hour. It has a nice setup, which is let down by a rushed race to the end. The gunfighter tracks Peter over as much of the resort as the budget can handle. For example, Roman World is Harold Lloyd's garden, littered with extras playing corpses. Or maybe they are just corpses, I don't know. I wasn't there, I've got witnesses. Westworld seemed content with the basic idea of a place where you could bang robots, and though the idea had a lot of potential beyond that, here they tell a fairly superficial story, like a pioneer who, looking for water, finds a spot with an abundant underwater river or artesian basin, but only digs a well three inches deep without striking water, and then calls it a day. That's right, so that's one large pepperoni with traditional crusts and anchovies. Uh, what's the difference between the garlic bread and the herb bread? 
With its modest budget and modest box office take, 22nd top earner at the domestic box office in 1973, behind films like the fairly unloved Battle for the Planet of the Apes, Westworld was considered a relative success, if not a massive hit, but its influence is undeniable. Crichton, not him, Michael Crichton was not involved with any of the Westworld spin-offs, but there were a few. An unsuccessful movie sequel, Future World, came and went in 1976, followed by a very short TV series in 1980, Beyond Westworld. Let's face it, John, it's your wits against Quaid's machines. Both with various amounts of implied robot banging. And that was it until Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy series for HBO in 2016, which was chock full of robot banging and killing. A show that starts off great and then becomes a world of... What? Pretty realistic, huh? Listen, are you sure he was a... Uh... Of course, you don't really think he shot anybody, do you? If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos. This review is brought to you by Stamfine Robotics' new kitchen assistant.